Hi, this is Joel Selvin, and you're listening to Your Morning Coffee, the podcast, with my friends Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart, weekly music news for the new music business. From Sherwood News, can streaming save the music biz? From Midia, songwriters take the stage, a new playbook for a new era. Tatiana Sirisano from Midia breaks it all down for us. And from Music Business Worldwide, artists and major music companies applaud introduction of landmark No Fakes Act in the U.S. Senate. Todd Dupler explains what it all means. All right. Well, Jay, we've got so much on a hot Saturday to talk about. So what do you say we get rolling? We're going to drop the needle down on the vinyl right about... Now. Stand by for transmission. This is London Calling. Wake up! The revolution is at hand! Your morning coffee is on the air. 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 Your morning coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. And now, from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. that song that was jane's addiction's new song imminent redemption and that's the original lineup of jane's addiction by the way uh glenn peoples and i recently interviewed uh, lead singer perry farrell for billboard's behind the setlist podcast what an interesting cat uh subscribe wherever you get your podcast that, it's a special one Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to seeing them out on the road, if possible. And uh, good to have them back. That whole, the, the original band, like you said, it's fantastic. Uh, don't forget, Jay, the Music Tectonics Conference is coming back to Santa Monica October 22nd through the 24th. Uh, discounted early bird tickets are available until August 20th. You and I will be there, and I am already looking forward to that because it's such a great event. Yeah. Really fun, a must-visit if you can possibly make it a beautiful Santa Monica. Yeah, what a, what a great set. And I was talking to Dimitri about this. A, a lot of what that value is, yeah, they have good you know presentations and panels and all of that. But just the people you run into, yes. you know, and waiting in line for coffee, or you know, they have this sort of poolside thing that's really cool. This is their sixth annual conference. Can you believe that sixth no. annual conference? And uh, sixth. I, I sat down with uh, our friend Dimitri Vitsa, and uh, I asked him, you know, what can we expect this year? Let's hear what he said. Dimitri, so good to see you. How are you? I'm great, Jay. It's great to see you too. Thanks for having me on. Wow. So Music Tectonics is coming up. It's my favorite conference. It's October 22nd through the 24th in Santa Monica, beautiful Santa Monica. And uh, early bird tickets are available through August 20th. What, What can we expect this year, Dimitri? 
Look, it's our sixth year. We've grown a little bit every year. I know. How's that possible? Sixth year. Um, and we've grown a little bit every year. We've really been focused on quality over quantity. So expect a lot of decision makers, investors, smart inventors and founders and all that kind of stuff. It's going to happen again. But this year we are adding another element, Jay. We're starting the Music Tectonics Creator Fair in addition to the, the main Ooh. conference. Yeah, so it'll be a chance to showcase innovations in musical creation, innovation, instruments, creator tools. Um, people who come will have a chance to uh, kind of build relationships with creators and influencers in that music making space. Love so it. adding in more of that creation side of it. I mean, they've been showing up from the beginning. Companies like Band Lab, who's sponsoring again. Love they're, Band Lab. Yeah, they're yep. coming again. They, they, they've been a part of the conference there's a there's a scene in that music creation tools world that recognizes that the music industry is shifting and there's more and more people and more types of people creating music than ever so we can sit, c continue to see that convergence of yeah. the so the creator fair is just sort of like an acknowledgement that we want more artists and producers there too this time. If you're building an AI tool, why don't you have some artists play with it and give you some feedback? If you're figuring out a sync pitching or music hosting platform, why don't you get some feedback directly from some, some artists and producers? So we're looking forward to that kind of vibrancy joining in the mix. And one more shout out real quick, if you don't mind, our Swimming uh, with Narwhal startup pitch competition is open now. So if anybody's a founder out there and they want to apply, all you have to do is get a badge to attend the conference. But the deadline, the deadline for the applications are August 12th. They'll get exposure to investors and advisors and so forth. So, um, yeah, just wanted to shout out if you have any founders out there, this is a good way to join in. Beautiful. And where do people find out more about uh, Music Tectonics? Yeah, just come to musictectonics.com and you can see everything. Our schedule, our speakers. We've just announced a huge lineup of speakers. So um, Tatiana Sirasano is going to be there. Mark Mulligan from Media Research. Bob Maz, Rishi Patel, Christine Osazua. Oh, she's great. Yeah, so a great lineup. Check it out at musictectonics.com. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. Thanks, Jay. Talk to you soon. Oh, that's awesome. That's Dimitri Vitsa. He's the Music Tectonics Conference Director. And of course, he's also the CEO of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a wonderful PR firm and a very snazzy dresser, I might add. <laughs> he's Super sure nice is. guy. He, he re I always feel grossly underdressed when I hang out with uh, Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Jay, let's thank our sponsors because, boy, we are so lucky. Whenever we put the show on, it is a great help that we get every week. Yeah, we have some great sponsors. A special thank you to Music.ai. Music.ai is a trailblazing AI-powered music and audio platform, and they offer an expansive suite of over 50 stackable AI audio solutions. Want to change the tempo or pitch of your song, adjust instruments or vocals, mute background noise, Music.ai makes it super easy. Embraced by record labels, agencies, tech firms, and developers, Music.ai is synonymous with audio innovation. With over 45 million users, their tools process over 2 million minutes of audio every day. They can process yours today. Visit Music.ai to get started. And today's podcast is brought to you by friends at Bandzoogle. Built by musicians for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a stunning website and online store for your music in minutes. All the features you need are already built in, like dozens of fully customizable templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list, integrations with Bandcamp, SoundCloud, YouTube, Bands in Town, and more so you can easily add content from your other online profiles, live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Websites plan, uh, website plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Our podcast listeners can jump over to bandzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code MORNINGCOFFEE, that's all one word, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's bandzoogle.com, promo code MORNINGCOFFEE. Yeah, and a big thank you to HypeBot since 2004, Hypebot Hypebot has chronicled the new music industry and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. Edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton with help from Alana Bonilla, Hypebot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform, Bands in Town. 
Indeed, Bands in Town. Over 80 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist service platform connecting over connecting over 590,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote tour, their tour dates across all platforms. Yeah, and finally, a big thank you to our friends over at Billboard Pro. You want to know what everybody in the music business is talking about? Get in the know with Billboard Pro. Uh, Billboard is offering your morning coffee readers and listeners a special 50% discount off the price of your subscription. So click on the link in your morning coffee. Indeed, big thanks to our amazing sponsors, Banzool, Music.ai, Hypebot, and Bands in Town. Big thanks. Couldn't do without you all. And of course... Speaking of couldn't do it without you all, how about Jay Gilbert? We could not do the show or the newsletter would not happen without (laughs) his diligent hard work. He is a music industry consultant. He's the curator of the weekly Your Morning Coffee newsletter and a former executive with Universal Music, Sony Music, and Warner Music Groups, and just a groovy guy. Well, thank you so much. Checks in the mail. Literally. And I get to do this podcast every week with my good friend, Mike Etchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music, Capital EMI, Universal Music Group, and the only guy I know who can fix a tractor. (laughs) Well, that... And 50 cents gets you that coffee over at McDonald's. So, uh, and well, you haven't seen my tractors actually work, though. That's the problem. Yeah, but it looks good. Uh, it looks good. That's right. Uh, by the way, before we start, Jay, I do want to share that I finally finished the great documentary Stax, Soulsville, USA. It's over on HBO. What an amazing documentary about Stax Records. Tell me. And Al Bell. Oh, my God. The guy who ran Stax. Uh, the guy. Who, I've met you just Al Bell. The, I'm, I've you met mentioned him in, that before, in Nashville yeah. recently. Yeah. Great guy. Why? Watch the documentary. I mean, he went through hell to get various things and things that befell the label. And it's a wonderful documentary, you know, very kind of sad and bittersweet, but Mm. wonderful. So highly recommended. Do check it out. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Well, let's jump into the stories, Jay. The first one from Sherwood News. David Crowther, Tom Jones, can streaming save the music business? Yeah. By the way, Sherwood News, I love their charter newsletter. It's C-H-A-R-T-R, just because I'm such a sucker mm-hmm. for you know great charts and graphs. But check out Sherwood News and, and check out their uh, charter uh, newsletter. Super good. All right. So can streaming save the music business in light of Spotify's record making earnings? Sherwood News is bringing back this four part deep dive where they explore how much money most artists make from Spotify, the evolution of song formats as a result of streaming as a mainstream platform and the return of touring. Right. So they say that, you know, for years, streaming has been heralded as the potential savior of the music world, you know, a harbinger of of change and could bring riches back to a wide pool of struggling artists, labels, and publishers, but especially on the back of recent news that Spotify has raised prices for the second consecutive year, some critics are starting to ask, why is this taking so long? Indeed, though there's never been a more convenient time to be a music fan with millions of songs just a tap away, in purely financial terms, the American music industry is still a fraction of its former self. Data from the RIAA reveals that once adjusted for inflation, that's the important part, Mm -hmm. recorded music revenues in the U.S. are still down 36% from their 1999 peak when millions were heading out to get their hands on CD copies of Believe by Cher or the Backstreet Boys' Millennium. I know that's one of your favorite songs and albums. <laughs> the, the days of, you know, checking overplayed CDs for scratches, using a pencil to fix an unspooled cassette tape or saving up for that state of the art Walkman. You know, that might seem as alien to contemporary music listeners as gathering around the gramophone. But uh, it's, it's hard to overstate how much change the music industry has endured in, in recent decades. Yeah, so vinyl's dominance in the 1970s when artists like Stevie Wonder and ABBA were selling millions of records was an era of music listening that is now heavily romanticized, even by Gen Z. But if if necessity is the mother of invention, convenience is surely a close relative with music lovers keen to take their favorite tracks with them and 12-inch records offering little in the way of portability. Smaller cassette tapes became the -the on-the-go option, only for CDs offering the same flexibility 
possibility with better sound quality to displace the cassette back in the 1980s, ushering in the industry's golden age and eventually accounting for 89% of revenue at its peak again in 1999. Right, that was a peak. And boy, I remember when I got my Sony Walkman, it was a game changer. And I don't use that term uh, frequently. It just, it made it so I wasn't sitting in our front room with the big headphones listening to my Stevie Wonder records. I could actually ride my bike and listen. It It was just amazing. You know, of course, the internet changed everything too. Compared to video files, audio files were considerably smaller, right? And and they were easy to share online. And that kickstarted a 15-year dark period for the industry in which piracy crushed its income. Downloads and and for a weird few years, even ringtones, offered some respite and you know for artists and labels. But it wasn't until the the green shoots of streaming that the uh, recorded music industry returned to real growth. As more and more of us sign up for services like Spotify to enjoy our favorite songs on demand, the income generated from streaming platforms has rocketed, with the Swedish streamer reporting more than fourteen billion dollars in revenue last year. But despite its growth, Spotify has never reported a full year of net profit. And whether those revenues are flowing through to the maestros behind the music remains a more complicated question. Yeah, it sure does. You know, artist remuneration, there's that word again, has been a hot topic for Spotify, you know, almost since its inception. So with top artists like Taylor Swift and Radiohead's Tom York temporarily taking their songs off of the service in past years and raising questions around how the company structures its royalties. Spotify has been pretty fixed in its response to criticism from disgruntled bands and artists, often pointing to the billions of dollars it hands over to music makers each year. Indeed, Spotify reportedly paid some $9 billion to rights holders, that's artists, labels, publishers, distributors, etc., in 2023, taking its lifetime total to more than $48 billion. Yeah, that's their go-to response. You and I talked about that last week. Those figures are from the company's latest Loud and Clear report, which also revealed revealed that the number of artists meeting various monetary milestones, like $10,000 in annual earnings, has nearly tripled over the last six years, with some 1,250 musicians now making more than a million dollars a year from Spotify streaming alone. It's worth noting, however, that with as many as 9.8 million artist profiles on Spotify, according to some estimates, the 11,600 artists who are managing to make it to that $100,000 threshold represent a minuscule share of the overall talent on the platform, and that those figures represent payments to rights holders, not necessarily what ends up in artists' pockets. Depending on individual arrangements, most will be split by varying extents with agents, labels, and publishers. Yeah, Polestar Magazine revealed that the top 100 North American tours, thanks in no small part to Ms. Taylor Swift and Beyonce, grossed $6.6 billion last year, the highest on record. And that's not just, you know, down to what they call funflation either. You know, the entertainment giant Live Nation reporting record concert attendance and ticket sales for last year, too. So bands and artists haven't just switched up how they make money because of streaming. The very way that many now write and construct songs is changing as a result of the medium, too. Indeed, recent reporting from the Washington Post highlighted how Spotify's monetization or monetizing methods, like its pay-per-play stream system or needing a listener to stick around for at least 30 seconds of a song, as well as the desire to go viral on TikTok, have led artists to write shorter, sharper, and more attention-grabbing tunes. Uh. Uh, Don't bore us. Get to the chorus, Mike. Uh, Looking at some of the biggest songs on the Billboard 100 for, um, you know, since 1960, they observed a similar trend with top songs released in in the last five years clocking in at like two minutes and 55 seconds compared to the three minutes and 59 seconds average throughout the 1990s. So they're, you know, these songs are definitely getting shorter. You know, that was during the golden age of CDs and music industry more widely. Um, When you get paid per stream, shorter is sensible. Right. So that was from Sherwood News, David Crowther and Tom Jones. Yeah, a really and great piece. Yeah, check, good piece. Check them out and look at that uh, charter, C-H-A-R-T-R uh, newsletter. Sign up for that thing. It's it's a blast. I get one every week and they always have some amazing charts and graphs on all sorts of different parts of the business. 
Yeah. So speaking of how streaming changes music, Glenn McDonald spent the last decade shaping how Spotify curates and recommends music. In his new book, he explains how it all works. The book, of course, is You Have Not Heard Your Favorite Song, How Streaming Changes Music. That is out now, and uh, I'm about to order it. And oh my God, I can hardly wait to get into it because all will be revealed. Yeah, it's it's really... It's really well written. I just finished it. I may read it twice. I rarely read a book twice, but there's so much in it. And and I told Glenn how much I, I enjoyed it. And there's a little bit of snarkiness to it. And you and I talk about people like Chris <laughs> Castle and some of our f- favorite writers. And Glenn is certainly one of those. Anyway, I, I did sit down this week and had a conversation with Glenn McDonald. And uh, let's let's listen in. Glenn, good to see you again. Thanks for joining me. Hey, good to be back. According to Luminate, at the end of 2023, there were 184 million tracks available to music fans and around 103,000 new tracks uploaded to digital service providers like Spotify every day. In your book, You Have Not Heard Your Favorite Song, How Streaming Changes Music, you point out that with that sheer volume of music, there's most certainly a lot of music out there that you would love if you heard it. How does a music fan today discover that music? I think the first thing to do is realize that those numbers don't matter. Like, don't be scared. The world is full of music. It's it's basically infinite. Like, every week there's like two more years of music. So you, you can't listen to it all, but that's fine. But you can find a lot of stuff. So to me, that just means curiosity is now the main getting factor. Like if you don't, if you didn't discover any new songs that you love this year, that's your fault. Like get curious. There are tools to help, but the tools will only help you if you want to be helped. So if you just sit back and let algorithms from streaming services tell you what to listen to, that you might discover something great that way, but you probably won't discover something that's really surprising to you. You probably won't discover something that's unlike anything else that you have heard. And more to the point, you won't be in the mood for something that's unlike anything you ever heard. You have to shift your mind to explore. It's like the difference between wandering through a foreign city when you're traveling and being like, it's 5.30, what are we going to have for dinner tonight? Let's order burritos. If if you ordered burritos on a on a stressful weekday night and some strange thing that you've never seen comes along, you'd be like, DoorDash screwed up my burrito order. But if you go wandering through a foreign city and you find something strange to eat, you're like, that's why I'm doing this. I'm I'm trying to find something I haven't eaten before. That's the same way with music. Like if you go looking for music, you'll be like, all right, I'm gonna listen to this thing I don't know. And I'm maybe I'll hate it, but I'm my mind is a little bit more open than if I'm just expecting the next thing that sounds exactly like my favorite pants. Yeah, I think that's a great comparison. Um, artist manager Jonathan Daniel once said, Give me a, a great song and my job's easy. Give me a good song. And my job is impossible. So let's assume for a moment that you're you're an artist with great music. How do you rise above the noise with that many tracks released every week to reach new fans in this new streaming track based world? I sort of wonder about the premise. Like the, I think there's a sort of uh, implicit competition in there. Like there are only a few great songs, and you know you shouldn't you shouldn't settle for anything but the few greatest songs. And I. To me, there are lots of things that I love a lot that are like really well done executions of some thing that might like I might not be arguing that they're the greatest song in some like all time taxonomy. Like if there's a new Gothic symphonic metal band, I want to hear them. And if they're just as good, like no better and no worse than the other ones, I'll be very, very happy. Like I just love that style and I and so many of those songs I think are the good songs in that thing. So I, I think I would turn it around and say the task for you as an artist is not to worry about whether you're good or great, but to find your community. And that, you know, if you're Taylor Swift, your community is Swifties. They're like people specifically devoted to you. But for most artists, their community is not 
centered on them. It's a community they are part of and their audience is part of and other bands like them or, or who are from their city or who do the same kind of thing or on the same record label or something. That's that's the community. And if you find a community that wants to hear whatever you do just because you did it and it's a thing that they like, and their first question is not like, is this an immortal great song and I'm not going to listen to it if it isn't? That's that's what you want. Receptive audience who likes the thing you do to begin with. In the introduction to your book, um, you talk about streaming, replacing shopping with exploring. I thought that was super interesting. Tell us about that a little bit. So, I, you know, I'm I'm old. You, you you and I are old. We remember when exploring music was like walking around in a record store, flipping through sealed plastic plastic wrapped cardboard envelopes that that you could tap on them all you want. They wouldn't play samples. Like, I don't know what was wrong with that technology, but you, you, like all you could do was speculate. And the only music I knew was that I didn't already own was what was on the radio or what my friends already had. And so I like, that's not really exploring. Like that's like flipping through a guidebook of a city that you're not allowed to travel to. And when you actually get there and you can just wander around, that's that's what streaming is like for me. You just listen. You just listen. It's not a shopping. It's not a buying decision. You're not deliberating. You don't have to like agonize like, you know, 14 year old me with eight dollars to spend this month had to like like if that if that investment went wrong, like that was it. I didn't I didn't have any. I could, that was the, the record I, I got to buy this month. So like, was it going to be Foreigner or Rush? Like it was going to be one of those because those were the ones I'd heard on the radio. So I'm like counting the number of songs that I've already heard on the album like that. That is a a very slow and and timid way to explore music. So for me, streaming, where I just play it all. If I don't like it, I'll skip it. If I don't like it the third time, I'll take it off my playlist, whatever. Just dive in, be immersed. Love it. Again, the book is You Have Not Yet Heard Your Favorite Song, How Streaming Changes Music uh, by Glenn McDonald. Uh, highly recommend it. And we'll be, uh, we'll be talking to Glenn uh, a little bit more about this book soon. Thanks, Glenn. We appreciate your time. Later. That is very interesting. Glenn has agreed to come and sit down with us for a special bonus episode of the Your Morning Coffee podcast. And boy, we are looking forward to that conversation. Stay tuned. Jay and I will let you all know when it's in the can and yeah. you can tune in because I can hardly wait to have a conversation with him. That'd yeah, be really fun. you're, you're going to dig him. And it it's, it's reminds me a little bit of when we did our vinyl roundtable table. It was an hour, but it could have easily been two, three hours with those yes. guys. And and that's how I feel about Glenn when you start talking to him. He's so knowledgeable, you know, about, you know, how the sausage is made, you know, when you get to streaming and algorithms and human behavior and data and all of that stuff. So anyway, highly recommend the book. You have not heard your favorite song, How Streaming Changes Music, and that's out now. Um, the, the next piece we want to cover is from Tatiana Sirisano and Fernanda Balzaretti from Midia. They released this really cool report this last week. Uh, the, the title was Songwriters Take the Stage, A New Playbook for a New Era. And it was absolutely amazing. You can, you can download sort of the highlights for free from Midia or through your morning coffee. Midia is M-I-D-I-A. Uh, they do some some of the best research ever. You know, we uh, we love those guys. Anyway, songwriters are often referred to as you know the backbone of the music industry. Yet in practice, songwriters have historically been under recognized, under appreciated, under underpaid, and this extends to the research field as well. Yeah, so while there are myriad studies, surveys, and reports about the recorded music industry and its, uh, and its artists, there is less information overall on songwriters. This is particularly problematic for the industry, given that songwriters and artists are increasingly one in the same. Yeah, good point. This report corrects those oversights and firmly takes the songwriter's perspective, focusing on the ways that the streaming era has upended both the business and culture of being a songwriter, and also how partners can adapt in response. 
So Midia has conducted its first ever survey of songwriters, revealing how they earn revenue, what they aim to achieve, what is holding them back, and what would help them succeed. Additionally, uh, Midia con- uh, conducted interviews with more than a dozen songwriters and publishing industry executives to better understand how these issues impact stakeholders all across the value chain. That's right. These findings are applicable across the entire music industry. After all, it's in everyone's best interest to help songwriters thrive as the industry begins everything with them. So here are a few of the key insights from the report. I'll I'll do the first one, which is lack of meaningful streaming income is songwriters' biggest challenge across tenure, career stage, and income level. Uh, This is also really interesting. The majority of songwriters in the media sample make under $10,000 annually. That's tragic. Right. Hard to uh, survive on that. The next one is songwriters look to grow revenue streams like sync. However, there's a cap to potential sync earnings. Many songwriters are looking for diversity into entirely new revenue streams, including ones that go way beyond royalties, such as works for hire and brand partnerships. Right. A brand image is becoming increasingly important, both for building external fandom and a network within the music industry. Songwriters most want tools and services to help them with sync pitching, that's sync licensing, getting your music in you know, a film, a TV show, a game. They want help with building a brand and connections to collaborators. I spoke to Tatiana Sarasano uh, about this important report this week. Let's listen in. Tatiana, good to see you again. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Jay. Always good to see you. You have put out this Songwriters Take the Stage. It's really a survey that you've done with Midia of over 300 songwriters. And it talks about how they earn revenue, you know, what their goals are, what they hope to achieve. Really, you know, what are some of the roadblocks, what's holding them back? Um, Tell us about this survey. Yeah, so um, at Midia, we have done so much work on uh, the artist side of the equation. We we do an annual creator survey. You know, we've done so much work on the artist artist services side of the industry, um, and we haven't done the same for songwriters. And I think we find, uh, of course, you know, the the thing I think everyone in, in the industry knows is that songwriters are often um, left out, I think, of industry discourse, and that extends to the research field as well. I feel like there's not enough data on um, on songwriters and how they're building their businesses. So we really wanted to put the focus on them. And this is our first ever survey of songwriters at Midia. Um, in addition to the global survey of over 300 of them, we also did over a dozen interviews with all sorts of songwriters at different stages of their careers um, and publishing industry executives as well to try and understand um, everyone's perspective because I mean, as everyone in the industry knows, publishing is like the most complex <laughs> part of the industry. And so we wanted to make sure that this report was as nuanced, nuanced as possible. Um, so yeah, very proud of the results and excited to see the, uh, the impact that it'll have. Yeah, as you know, it's near and dear to my heart. I thought it was a fantastic survey. There's so many things that people need to read through this so they understand, you know, the songwriting side, the publishing side. What did the songwriters tell you about, you know, their path today, their focus and some of those challenges? Yeah, so um, just to kind of give some context, um, the you know as with artists and everyone else in the industry the streaming era has totally upended the way that songwriters make money um because in the cd era you know um songwriters were earning most of their money up front from the initial sale of the cd that they were on and then that was followed by kind of a steep drop in revenue so you got everything up front and it didn't matter if the song that you contributed to the cd was a flop or a hit because as long as the cd was selling you were making money Um, but they weren't monetizing consumption and neither was the rest of the industry, right? We weren't monetizing each listen of the CD after that. So now theoretically, there is actually there's more revenue than ever coming from the song. The the lifetime revenue that a song can generate has grown so much because we're monetizing every listen. Um, but songwriters are not getting that revenue up front. It's sort of like this slow trickle over time which I think is part of the reason why many songwriters have been motivated to sell their catalogs, because it's hard to make a day-to-day living when your income is coming in this slow trickle. Um, And as we have, we kind of break down in the report, I won't get into it, but um, what percentage of, uh, you know, the revenue generated by every stream ends up making it to songwriters. And it's, 
a small percent of a very small percent divided between ever more songwriters that are on these songs. So it's just very difficult to make a living and every song has to be successful. It's not like in the CD era where you could have a flop on a CD and still be okay. Um, every song has to be a hit. So um, songwriters we found are just very reliant on royalties in a way that artists have sort of diversified beyond these days. You know, so many artists are making uh, more revenue through merchandise, through touring, through these things that monetize fandom, but songwriters don't have those same options. So we found from songwriters that they're really trying to diversify their revenue um, and trying to find ways to earn more upfront. Um, and that's another reason why you hear a lot of um, advocacy for per diems to become standard for our songwriters to get paid for studio time and things like that. And I'll stop there because I don't want to ramble too long about this one question, <laughs> but that's sort of an overview of um, what we heard about their businesses today. Well, thank you. And we could talk about this for hours. Where can people get the report, learn more about media, watch that video uh, that you recorded with a couple of uh, songwriters? Where can people learn more? Yeah, so we have a landing page for this report at um, mediaresearch.com slash songwriters, and their clients can access the full report, which is nearly 50 pages of information. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that this research reaches far and wide. So we did, we created a number of free resources that are available on that landing page as well. So you can download um, a free summary of the report. And there's also a video where we had two amazing songwriters, um, Mariami Bibilori and uh, Helianne Linval, um, discuss some of the findings. Um, so those are you know free to everyone. Fantastic work. Thank you, Tati. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for the support. Always great to hear from our friend Tatiana. What a great piece, as always. Yeah, Tatiana is an award-winning music industry journalist, senior music industry analyst and consultant at Midia, just an overall badass. And there is a link to download that free summary that we mentioned, uh, Songwriters Take the Stage, and that's in your morning coffee or at Midia. Uh, check it out. Great work by uh, Tatiana and, and Fernanda. Yes, indeed. And our last story, Jay, it's from Music Business Worldwide. Daniel Tensor writing, this artists and major music companies applaud introduction of landmark No Fakes Act in the U.S. Senate. Numerous groups representing artists and rights holders have backed new landmark legislation designed to fight the proliferation of AI deepfakes, including musical deepfakes here in the U.S. Right. It, that's an incredible acronym, uh, the No Fakes. It stands for Nurture Original foster art and keep entertainment safe aka no fakes <laughs> that act would you know establish for the first time a federal property right in one's own voice and likeness which is shocking that doesn't exist today the bill was introduced in the u.s senate uh, last wednesday by two democratic senators uh, that's chris coons from Del delaware and amy klobuchar from minnesota and two republicans Sen uh, senator marcia blackburn of tennessee and senator tom tillis of north carolina Right. So the bill has received backing from many prominent members of the music industry, including Warner Music Group CEO Robert Kinsel, who appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee in April in support of the legislation. Uh, back then, he said, I'm honored to have testified about the urgent need for deep fake legislation at the Senate Judiciary Committee's April 30 hearing. And I'm grateful to Senators Coons, Blackburn, Col Klobuchar and Tillis for their thoughtful crafting of the No Fakes Act. So I spoke to Todd Dupler. He's the Recording Academy's Chief Advocacy and Public Policy Officer. What a great line. How, how cool that is that? Job. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> great uh, business card. Anyway, I talked to Todd uh, about this landmark legislation, and he broke it down for me. Let's listen in. Todd, so good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Numerous groups representing artists and rights holders they're backing a proposed new legislation designed to fight the spread of AI deepfakes, including musical deepfakes in the U.S. And, and this is called the No Fakes Act. And, and I love that it's an acronym. It's uh, Nurture Originals, Foster Art, and Keep Entertainment Safe. Well played. Um, tell us about this legislation and, and how the Recording Academy is involved. Sure, absolutely. So... You know, at the Recording Academy, we know that AI is another tool and artists and creators have always used new technology to create new things. AI is no different. 
Um, but we also know there's certain risks associated with AI, and we've seen the negative impact as well as the positive impact, uh, especially around the use of, of voice, of image. Uh, people have had their own selves kind of misappropriated or um, exploited or abused by folks that can use AI uh, to manipulate their voice, manipulate their image, uh, use it to do things that they would never do. Um, and so this seems like a very clear space that as we engage the potential, the positive potential of AI, this is the place where artists and creators really need protection. Um, the No Fakes Act is, is a, again, kind of a landmark piece of legislation. You know, at the federal level, we've never had protection for image or likeness or voice. And so what the No Fakes Act does, it creates a property right. It says that you as an individual have an individual property right and how your image and likeness and voice are used. Um, and somebody cannot use AI to manipulate it without your permission, without uh, compensating you, without licensing it from you. And so provide some guardrails. And it, it follows up on a health bill that was introduced earlier this year called the No AI Fraud Act, which is a different acronym. Uh, the No Fakes Act is, the, is a Senate version of the same idea, um, but a, a new piece of legislation. And this one involved a really diverse spectrum of stakeholders. So certainly uh, the music industry, artists and creators, as well as uh, SAG-AFTRA on, on the actor side, but also the movie studios um, who have worked kind of on the other side of this issue because they use AI as a tool. And so they've been um, you know, a, a stakeholder that we've had to navigate with, um, as well as tech companies like a IBM and OpenAI. So, the senators who introduced this legislation really wanted to work with a really broad section of stakeholders to get the most support they could. Awesome. Where can people learn more about the No Fakes Act? Absolutely. So uh, first, I would point people to um, at the Recording Academy, we have an artificial intelligence hub. That's really a one-stop resource about all of these AI issues. If you go to recordingacademy.com, you can look um, under about or advocacy and see our artificial intelligence hub. I also want to encourage people to uh, look up the Human Artistry Campaign. The Human Artistry Campaign is a coalition of um, over hundreds now of creator and artist groups um, that are supporting ethical uses of AI, and they have a lot of great information on their website as well. We're a founding member of the group. Well, thanks, and uh, keep up the great work, Todd. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jay. Good stuff to hear that going on. And again, yeah, it's kind of about time for that. It's surprising it took this long, actually. And I, I want to be, I want to know who that person is that when they're when they're coming up with a name, they have to figure out the act, what the acronym means. That's, that's a no, good job. No fakes. Love that. <laughs> that's right. Well, Jay, as we wrap up the show, we want to uh, mention, if you do tell one friend, we'd certainly appreciate it. If you yeah. enjoyed the show, big thanks to Banzoogle, music.ai, Hypebot, and Bands in Town. Boy, we certainly appreciate that. And on behalf of my good friend, Jay Gilbert, I'm Mike Etchart. Thanks for listening in, and we will be back next time on the Your Morning Coffee Podcast. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.